I'm going to mute again. Okay. All right, so I'm recording too. Okay, so I guess uh, good evening, everybody. Um, tonight we have uh, Brian McKay. He's uh, been with us for a while. Um, uh, actually, well, there we go. Uh, why don't you uh, give a rundown of your experience, Brian? I mean, okay. how long have you been in the team and you know, how long uh, have you been with the club? Um, I think I've been probably a year or so, or maybe a little longer. Um, I live here in Greenville, so I've not actually been to a meeting <laughs> yet, but okay. the bit of a drive for a, a weekday, okay. you know, prior to COVID when you had the in-person meetings. Yeah. yeah. One of these days, who knows, maybe we'll get uh, herd immunity for Christmas. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess you can take it away. So Brian McVeigh tonight is going to show us uh, uh, how he constructed a uh, mosaic from uh, images that he took around the Orion constellation. So take it away, Brian. All right. Well, I guess uh, I want to show, I guess like most people, I would imagine with uh, when they do visual, you know, this is one of the first things they look at is Orion, you know, the Orion Nebula. And, you know, usually it's probably one of their first targets as well. So um, this was my first one. <laughs> it was basically just a digital SS SLR. I propped it up on the hood of my car and took like a five or six second image of it. And I was so blown away that you could actually see it. And this was actually two years ago in uh, 2019. And since then, I've <laughs> managed to get it uh, looking like this. So it's quite a difference there. <laughs> um, but the process, the original plan, I just wanted, I was trying to do a four panel just to get all of Orion in all the way to the rosette in the cave right here. And I was, Imaging that, you know, every time I got a clear night, you know, this bottom four panels probably took uh, a couple months as far as just getting all the data. And I'm doing a mono camera, so I was doing RGB plus hydrogen alpha. Um, and then once I got the four panels done, there was actually earlier this winter, there was like a, a, a week of clear skies for the, the whole week, I had good seeing, and it was a new moon. So I decided to try to expand this up another two panels up, to, you know, four panels total to get all the way up here to the flaming star. And I just did it all in this sequence generator and, you know, had the telescope running every night and got all that data and then process everything. Um, so, Let's see. So I've got my telescope outside and I got like a little mini PC running on it so I can remote desktop into that computer, which is here. And I can run sequence generator and PhD. I can do the polar alignment with sharp cap and I can take my phone out and remote into it and have the display there to do all that stuff. So in sequence generator, as far as to frame it, I was using the frame in a mosaic wizard and have this on for 60 degrees to get the whole thing in there. So the original mosaic was oh, what's going on? four panels. So I had it about like that. And then once you create a sequence, it'll add all four of those into your queue and you know, you can set how many red, green, blues, and hydrogen alphas, and it'll just run through that. I've got, you know, an autofocus here and stuff, so it pretty much automates everything. And then once I got all those, I just added panels up on top of it. Like that, and just kind of added those and created, you know, two more panels and worked on those and then added another two on top of that. And that brought me all the way up to the flaming star. 
like that. And then uh, once I got all that, went into Pix Insight, and that's where I do all my processing. So this is actually the pre-processing done with just the first four panels. So I had this whole thing was just filled with files. I think at one point, uh, crash picks in sight because I'd had so many files open at the same time and it, it ran out of disk space <laughs> working on it. Uh, but originally I tried to make, you know, the full mosaic, you know, do a red mosaic, a green, a blue and a hydrogen alpha and try to combine those into one mosaic. But it didn't, it didn't really work very well for me because the, the gradients were just real bad when I combined into the color. So what I ended up doing is actually just doing, uh, combining each panel into RGB. And once I had all four panels or eight panels in RGB, then I created the mosaic out of that. And then uh, I did it with, uh, with the script. So you did the, uh, you'd solve each of the image, uh, plate solve them, it'll save all that into the fits header. And I'll run that through, where is that? Mosaic. Mosaic by coordinate. So you'll add all your individual RGBs into here, and then it will, register them together and align them. And then you'll get a big image the size of what your mosaic is going to be. And then it'll have each of those panels. So once you run the, each of those panels through here, you'll end up with a bunch of these. So this is the full mosaic with each panel on it. Like that. And then you'll use these in another script and then that'll add it to the mosaic. And actually, once I finished this, they updated Pix Insight and made a much easier way to do it. So I ended up redoing all that to make it with that new script, which is they have a mosaic tile <clears throat> and photo photometric mosaic. So basically, you would take uh, the first one, then you add the second one. to that and basically you click. There's some different things you can do. Um, actually, when I, the first one I did was this. So this was the old way. And the issue I was having with that is you get all these pinched stars. So if there's a bright star on the transition, then you get this weird artifact like that. You get all this green and weird colors. And that's all, it's a bunch of them throughout the image, you know, through here. And there's so many stars that it's the old way to do it. You had to go back to your image like this, find the individual star and like delete the star to try to prevent that from happening. But this new process actually does all that automatically for you, which is super nice. Uh, but you would open that up put your first two in there. And then if you click the sample generation, it'll process that real quick. And then it's going to pull up the transition where that border is going to be. And it's going to map out all the stars and all the ones that would have been the bright ones. It'll, it can reject those samples. So that when you actually put the mosaic together, it you don't get any of those pinch stars, so you don't get that weird dark artifact on there. So that's going to pull up here real quick. So these are all this is the overlap area, and then if you go to target model, so this you can delete all the ones that aren't in the grid, so that it'll it'll just do that automatically, and you don't have to worry about going back and deleting all those little stars there and then uh you hit okay and then it's going to splice those together and the way the new script works is you you have to go in columns or rows 
So what I did is I did bottom left and then I added the one on top of that, added on top of that until I got the four panels up and did it again with the four panels on the right. And then I had two mosaics, the left half and the right half, and then spliced those together, creating the full mosaic. This should pop up here in a sec. And I actually did a lot of this processing <laughs> at work because I, I can remote desktop in there and do all the pre-processes and stuff while I wait, which is nice. But then you end up with this and then you'll open up that same script. And then you'll, you'll have this image as the reference and then you'll put uh, the next one that would go right here under here, hit OK again, and then that's going to put that third tile underneath it, and then that's going to pop a new image up, Then you can shut this one, and then you'll add the fourth one under that, and then you'll have basically the left half of the mosaic, and you'll do the same thing for the right half, and then you'll have two big images up, and then you'll combine those together, and then you'll have this one right here, which is that's actually after the hydrogen alpha. So what I did is I had an RGB mosaic, and then I did the same thing with all the hydrogen alpha panels, and I had a full HA mosaic. Uh, that one's upside down. Uh, um, so basically, once I had the RGB and the hydrogen, I took I did the star net process, removed the stars, so I just had all the nebula, and then did uh, in uh, pixel math, I blended the hydrogen alpha with the red channel, and then ended up with this. And then uh, to get all these little items here to pop, I made some masks, which, uh, let's see. Yeah, where is it? So I made a bunch of range masks and then put them into Photoshop and deleted everything except the part that I wanted to work with. So if I wanted to do the spaghetti nebula, I would flip that. So basically, I had a range mask of just that, and then I would apply it over here. invert that mask and then I'd have just that. And then I would open up the curves transformation here. And then I could take the red channel and this is, that's what it, about what it did look like. And then with the mask, I can bump the reds up and then you can really see what that looks like. And you can adjust the saturation whatever you do to kind of make that pop a little better. And then I had a mask for that, this one, that right there. And some of the, I basically made these off of the hydrogen alpha. So anything I could see in that hydrogen image, once I took the stars out, then I could use those masks and make those pop out in the RGB image. Hey, Brian. Uh huh. Yeah, so that one mask that you're talking about, what object is that? Can you tell us a little bit about that one, Cliff? So that's this one right here, the uh, spaghetti nebula. Oh, okay. So I, yeah, I thought that's what that was. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I never knew where it was in relation to any of this stuff until I did this mosaic. I've imaged it separately before, but normally I just, you know, put it in the sequence generator, hit, you know, slew to it and the telescope points to it and does its thing but 
Um, yeah, I, you know, did that mask for for here and and each of these little objects just to kind of make those pop out a little bit better. And then uh, just played with the curves and and saturation and stuff. And then I ended up with this one. I just kind of made the background a little lighter and you know do the noise reduction and sharpening and whatnot. And that's pretty much it. As far as how I how I put it together. I mean, it took it was probably three or four months total working on that. You know, I just I haven't really seen I've always wanted to do something really wide like this with an astronomy specific camera, because most of the stuff you see online that's this wide angle is usually, you know, a full frame camera with like a 35 millimeter lens or something. Uh, but I wanted to see what I could do with like in like I this was an ASI 1600 on a 50 millimeter Nikon lens. Um, so I wanted to see what I could do with, you know, the mono images plus adding the hydrogen alpha into it to get a really wide angle like this. And when I really what got me into trying to do that is, you know, I see all these Milky Way images that people are doing with these digital cameras in the camera lens. And I wanted to do that with the ASI 1600, which is what I, this was the first one I did with that. So Brian? What's that? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so you used the uh, 1600 uh, uh -huh. camera for this. Uh, did, uh, did you use, uh, uh, do, uh, or excuse me, was that uh, 1600 camera uh, used for all of these? As in, was it uh, a black and white? Uh, camera and you just went through RGB and then you went to hydrogen alpha. You didn't use a one shot color at all. Yep, this was all the ASI 1600 uh, mono. So I had uh, red channel, red, green, blue combined everything. Uh, so I would take each panel, you know, red panel one, green panel one, blue panel one, combine those into an RGB image. And do the same with the panel two, three, four, all the way up to eight, and then combine those. So this was all mono and quite a lot of images. <laughs> I think the let's see. Do you think a uh, color camera is in order eventually? I I mean I I have a QHY eighty three one eighty three color. Um, I don't know. It's once I started doing mono and seeing how good the images came out, <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't really switched back. Hey, uh, Brian, it's Mike Fulbright. Uh -huh. um, I I didn't recall what I was curious what OTA OTA you used. Um, what are your sky conditions like, and how did you choose uh, exposure times for all your filters? Thanks. So, for this, it was. An ASI 1600 with a 50 millimeter Nikon lens uh, for each of those panels. So I just had a kind of to make that work because with the Nikon lens, you can't actually control the aperture separately unless it's connected to a, a Nikon body. So I had to, I had the ZWO Canon adapter screwed onto the filter wheel. And then a Nikon to Canon converter, which had an aperture, a manual slider, and then the lens was attached to that. So I could manually open the aperture to, so I didn't have the, uh, what is it called? The coma on the edges of all the stars. Um, so that was what I used. I had a little tube ring that connected onto a little plate and I had the autofocuser with a little belt wrapped around the lens so I can use that, you know, it would rotate the autofocuser and that would move the belt on the focus ring of the camera lens in order to, to get the focus for all the filters. Um, and I'm out in Grifton uh, outside of Greenville. So I've, I'm about a Bortle four here. And most of this, most of the RGB was taken during a new moon or you know, whenever the moon was not out and then I waited for the moon to do all the hydrogen. Um, 
Is there anything else? I was curious how you worked out your exposure times. Okay. Um, this was actually, I did this before. I know I had, uh, you actually convinced me to go with the shorter exposure times, um, which I had just switched to not too long ago because I was actually looking at the exposure tables that you can find online for the 1600. And I, I just was confused by the numbers. And I thought that I basically chose my exposure times based on the ADUs and on the exposure table, I thought that it was in, in like eight bit and I converted it to 16. <laughs> so I multiplied those numbers by 16 to get 6,000. So I basically aimed for 6,000 ADU on each of these filters uh, when in reality, I didn't need to multiply it. So I was doing, I think the red channel, I was shooting like, what was it? I think I was shooting like 300 some, some odd seconds for red. I can actually pull that up. Let's see. So I guess the point was you ended up using a lot of short exposures, but you still got an amazingly deep image out of it by just sitting well, on it long enough. Well, I think I was actually overexposing compared to what I'm shooting now. Cause I was, yeah, yeah. I'm saying the ones you eventually used were what, like 60 seconds or. This was actually from all the longer ones. Oh, I'll get so you. I, I switched. I finally, you know, after reading Michael's post, um, I'm now, these were all 6,000 ADUs was the exposure for each of these. And now I'm shooting like 700 or something for, <laughs> for the color. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. But, yeah, no, it's a great image and your processing is exquisite. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I think the hydrogen was like 800 seconds each. And so now I'm shooting 300. And I think my red, green, and blue were somewhere around 300. And now I'm shooting like 100 to 120 seconds. Um, any other questions? But I think this whole project was ended up being, um, let's see. Um, I have so many files in here, it's hard to find everything. But I, I think this whole project ended up being like, it's like three or 400 gigabytes of, with all the files after, after all the processing. Cause you know, I had all the raw data and then after you register it and have the registered and calibrated. And, you know, I did these a few different times and ended up being almost half a terabyte just for this one project. And I think the final images, some of these are two and a half gigs just for an individual image. So it's quite a lot of hard drive space. So I'll ask, um, so what were the biggest challenges? And if you had, what advice would you have to someone wanting to do a project like this? Um, it wasn't super challenging getting the images. Um, luckily I had enough, you know, clear sky and that I had this one amazing week where literally I had like 10 days back to back clear skies with good seeing and it happened to be on a new moon. So I just left everything outside. I've got a telegizmo cover on it. So I just, I was running this thing every day. Um, the hardest part was probably just the processing of it. So, I mean, something this big, you really need a fast computer, lots of Ram <laughs> and, and a big hard drive. Cause with all these, files open and all the processes I had open, the scratch drive on the Pixon site was filled up. So it just, it kept freezing. I almost lost the whole project at one point because it 
PixInsight froze. It wouldn't let me save the whole project. So I went in there and was individually saving each of these files. And <laughs> so I would make sure you got enough hard drive space because it filled it up pretty quick uh, working this because my scratch drive where it saved all the all the processes were on my main regular hard drive, which isn't, you know, it's not quite as big as my other one. So this one's only 220 gigs. So it filled that up really quick, just working on it versus, you know, you should probably put it on the larger drive, but it's probably just hard drive space and having a, a quick computer. I think your skill level makes it a lot, seem a lot easier than it really is for you to have put this together like this is uh, quite a high level project. So you, you should be really proud of yourself. It's a, uh, it's nice to see. Thanks Thank for you. presenting all that. Of course. Yeah. And uh, Brian. Yeah. So uh, we've got some uh, uh, questions over in the chat window here. Um, uh, actually, I unmuted. I think I unmuted Andy. Andy, can yeah. you hear us? I'm, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Okay. So you asked uh, uh, when assembling the mosaic, are the images uh, still linear? Before you, uh, before Brian answers that question, uh, can you just elaborate just Simply, what, what do you mean by linear? Uh, whether the data has been stretched yet. Um, you know, everything's really dark when you first take your image and you stretch it to make things visible. I didn't know if he was uh, using the uh, data pre-stretched or post-stretched before combining it all. So um, I combined the RGB pre-stretch. Um, uh, let's see if that's, yeah, that's already stretched. So yeah, I mean, when I worked, working on each of these individual red, green, and blues, I was doing that all pre-stretch. Um, and then I did the color combination, the color calibration, all that stuff linear uh, before stretching. And then I stretched the RGB to get, uh, you know, this was my RGB. I think that might actually be, no, that's still on there. But once I stretched this, then I uh, worked on the hydrogen separately, which this is actually pre-stretched right there, that, that file. But then I stretched the hydrogen. And then once I got that stretched, I ran StarNet to take the stars out and then combined the hydrogen with the RGB with pixel, uh, pixel math. Um, well, I was talking about when you're doing the um, the tools that do the that PixInsight has to actually assemble the mosaic, where it's uh, splicing them together. Was that using linear or was that using stretch data? Mm, I've never used the I've never done mosaic, so I'm curious about that. When you were loading the reference image and loading the second image to make the columns and all that, that was all pre-stretched. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. I had to think about that. It was been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was all pre-stretched. So I created the mosaic pre-stretched and then once it was put together then I stretched it and worked on the curves and in the histogram and stuff okay. on that and then did the same with the hydrogen and then I combined the two and and then I started uh, processing that after. So do the picks and site tools uh, eliminate all the seams or did you have to do anything manually to to get rid of seams? It did a really good job with the seams. Um, the, like the issue I had with the seams, the first the first time I did it was right before they updated PixInsight and added those mosaic tools. So I had to do um, the, once I registered it, I, I used the gradient merge mosaic. So you would load all those individual files in here and then hit the global button. And then it would create a mosaic like this. But the issue was with that was you had all these pinch stars right here because any bright star that was right on that line, you got these weird artifacts on it and they were all in it. You know, with, with all eight panels, you know, I mean, you have a seam here, a seam here, a seam here, here, all the way up. And each of those had 20, 30 of these pinch stars. And the only way to fix that before they made that tool was you had to go into 
each of these. And then you had to try to find which of those stars was pinched and then use clone stamp and just try to delete each of these individual stars, which took hours and it, I still didn't get them all. And then once I finished it, I think like a week later, they updated PixInsight and added these tools. <laughs> so I went Would back. You like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went back, I, I read a quick tutorial on how to use this and then I added it. You know, I did both sides, put them together and not a single pinch star. It took care of it all on itself. So this made it much, 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 much easier. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brian, we have uh, another question from Mark. Um, I don't know if he wants to speak personally, but uh, what he did, uh, well, what he asked rather, uh, is what kind of uh, mount uh, or tracker did we use? So I've got a, an Atlas EQG which is basically the same as the EQ6 from uh, Star Wars or Skywatcher. Okay. I was using that. I have a, a 90 millimeter refractor, which is what I normally use. And I mean, it's quite overkill for, you know, a camera lens with that little thing on it, but that's what I had in it. You know, I could probably take a 30 minute picture with that because there's, it's not really moving much, but. Yeah, that's what I used for this project. Yeah, I made a feeling kind of uh, uh, the mount I use uh, because it's got a 75 pound capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of images that I take with DSLR uh, lenses. So it's like, well, what can you do? You have to mount the tels you have to mount it on top of a telescope for the mount to even work. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's what I did at first before, because I didn't have any, I had no clue how to mount just the camera and the lens on it. So I had that Atlas out there with the telescope on it and I bolted the camera where the guide scope would go. Yeah. And did it like that. And then now I have, it's basically like a rectangular plate with a bunch of screw holes in it. And I've been able to screw the camera into that. I've got the guide scope screwed next to it. And then the autofocuser is in the middle with the little belt that wraps around the end of the lens. And then I got a little uh, Vixen dovetail underneath that and I can just pop that right in the mount. Very good. Um, I can't remember if you already said this, most likely you did, but uh, my mind is going so fast. It brought to detail to everybody saying, uh, but uh, uh, how, many, uh, uh, how many pixels are in this? Uh, this mosaic? Um, oh, um, let's see. <laughs> so it's about, it's like about, um, let me see. I think I can, it's a lot. <laughs> or, let's see. It tells you the bottom, the width. I can't quite read it. What, 7,200 by? Uh, what is that 12,000 <laughs> down at bottom middle of the yeah, way seven, down yeah, yeah. 7,400 by 11,000? Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't even see that fix, Mike. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, if I can find, I think I would start a house fire with my laptop if they try to work with something. Like <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was when I had all eight panels open, you know, each, you know, red one, two, three, four for eight panels. I mean, I just bought this computer brand new, like less than a year ago. And it's, you know, it's, I've got like 32 gigs of RAM and it was maxing this thing out. Jeez. Please tell me that your goal is to eventually make a mosaic that's, uh, you know, one gig of it too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's my dream, I guess. I, don't know. I mean, I might, you know, next year, you know, I might add a panel to the side of it and just keep going <laughs> and see what else I can get in there. Yeah, don't stop. But let's see. Two point four gigs. Wow. Let's see. Uh, 
I don't think, I think at some point, somewhere it told you how many megapixels it was. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have to do the math. <laughs> Yeah. Just a slight plug here in April, we're going to have a fellow talk about a 200 panel mosaic so Ooh. we can hear about the computers he had to build to do that. But um. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not ready to sign up for that. I think eight is about the most I've done. And, and as you could see, it's 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 it really pays off, but it is a lot of work. Yeah, um, it, it just scales really fast when you have to do more. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, I was trying to do it in my head, so just keep things simple, 7.6 uh, times 11 and a half, and I got those like, okay, well, send me something, and well, just keep moving, just pop it up here, it's about 81 megapixels. Yeah, I mean, this is like just opening this image, is takes like 10 seconds just to open it on this computer, so I can't imagine having 80 panels, you know, just <laughs> work with, once you start adding panels to, to that much stuff is, must take quite a lot of power. Okay, um, let's see. It doesn't look like I have uh, anything else here. Um, I guess uh, you said your future plan is to, uh, actually before I say that, uh, and, Again, um, this is just me forgetting things here. Um, I'm looking down at the bottom there near Orion's Bell. What's that green thing? Uh, yeah, that's a uh, comet. Oh, and I was about to say, I think it's a comet, maybe. Yeah. And I got I got lucky on that. I didn't even know it was there when I started the mosaic. I was, I think this was the first panel I was doing was this one right here. And I got the data and I just combined it just to see what it looked like to, in color. And then there was a little green blob. And I was like, what is that? I was like, I thought I messed something up. Something Exactly. I thought it was like uh, some sort of like bad pixel area or whatever. Yeah. I thought something in the green channel was, was bad. So I, I, I think I opened up Sky Safari and went back to that time and zoomed in on it. And sure enough, that was Comet Atlas something or other. And it happened to be right there. <laughs> Maybe good off to just like make a separate image of that area and show it to us. Yeah, and this is what it looked like uh, yeah, uh, right behind that star. So, yeah, and I boosted a little bit in processing, but yeah, I mean, that makes it even more unique. You know, you got that. And luckily, I guess by the time when I did this panel right here, um, because I think this moved right through all the way up past the flaming star. So I guess luckily I didn't have a clear skies until several weeks later or several months later. Otherwise I'd have the comet here and then it'd be here and then I'd have it here and, and up here <laughs> if it was moving as I progressed up on the, on the mosaic. But luckily by the time I started working on this, it had already moved out of the, out of the frame. Okay, uh, so you said that you're probably going to expand on this in the future. Yeah, I mean, I it would be nice to if you have a computer, I can do so. Yeah, <laughs> um, but maybe move it over to the right and get Pleiades, and I think the California Nebula is right up here. Um, so if I put four more panels here, I get Pleiades. But I think in order to get California, which is up here, I'll, I'd have to add a panel here, here, and here. So that'd be almost another eight panels added to that. Or if I went down below, I could get the seagull and pop that in there. But I mean, it could be a work in progress. You know, each year I can, you know, keep adding to it and just make it bigger and bigger. Okay, very good. Uh... All right, well, I guess that's all we have here. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Uh, again, feel free to speak up. No? Okay. Well, I thank you, uh, Brian, for uh, talking us through this. And uh, just something else to bring up to the group, uh, if you haven't seen it already on the uh, mailing list there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
this uh, image was actually posted or uh, printed into uh, Sky and Telescope, and uh, which is a, uh, I guess, a prestigious honor. So I'm sure you're like all giddy about that, uh, Ryan. Um, yeah, I I submitted it after I completed it, and then I forgot all about it. And then I got I got two magazines in the mail, and I honestly thought that it was like for from the club. I thought that it was part of like the astronomy astronomical league or something where you got a free magazine. So I was kind of thumbed through it, didn't even see it. It sat on my counter for probably two or three weeks. And then I actually in, had <laughs> COVID two weeks ago. So I had to stay home from work for a couple of weeks. And I was just sitting in the, in the kitchen, thumbing through the magazine. And I was like, you know, this giant mosaic of Orion popped up and I was like, huh, well, that looks awfully familiar. And then I looked at the tag and my name was on it. And I was like, holy crap, I got <laughs> my image in the magazine. Well, Steve Goodman, he actually, yeah, uh, I was going to ask the question, but Steve Goodman also asked it. I, I would almost think they would like tell you that it's like, hey, we're going to do this or you know, ask permission or something. Well, I submitted the image for them. You know, I guess once you submit the image, that gives them permission to use it if they decide to to publish it. I mean, there was a little letter that came with it and I kind of glanced over it and I thought it was just like, hey, thanks for being a member. Here's your magazine. <laughs> Very good. Okay. All right, well, uh, I guess that concludes the uh, presentation. Uh, we'll get to the second half of the meeting uh, uh, where uh, members uh, present their images. Uh, this uh, is to go. Hey, uh, Chris. Yes. Can I make a quick announcement real quick before we get into that? Just yeah, yeah, um, sure, go for it. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention uh, next month. Uh, thanks again, Brian, for the, the talk. That was well yeah. done. I appreciated cool. it. Thank you. Uh, next month, we're going to have uh, Dale Gint talking about Nina. He's one of the developers on Nina. If you haven't used it, Nina is one of the kind of up and coming programs like SGP and Voyager for data collection. And uh, he's, he's not a member, but he's agreed to come and speak to us. So I would appreciate we have a good showing for him. Uh, he's taken you know, some time to come present for us. And then the other thing is uh, I put up a poll today. Uh, I had a lot of people asking me about Affinity Photo, which is a Photoshop-like program. And so if you wanna see me uh, talk about it for about an hour, just go to the poll and pick the, the weekend the Saturday, which you prefer, and just vote. And I'll try to pick the one that works for the most people. So that's all I had to add. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, no problem. OK, who would uh, like to uh, present their images? Let me make sure I see if that's in chat. Let me look at uh, make sure I have time. OK, everybody should be able to share. Um, Anybody? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> I've got one. Okay, go for it. Can y'all see that? Is it shared? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, it's the only one I have, but this is um, region around IC405. I've been sitting on this data for like a couple months. Um, I'm going to spend some more time on it. I just did a real quick processing of it uh, last night. Um, this was taken back during that week that Brian mentioned when we had a week of clear skies uh, in November. And I set up my stuff to run on like four different targets and just ran all night for five nights. I ended up getting probably too much data on this because I wasn't really tracking, but it was the one that was up the most during the night. So it got the most time. I um, ended up with about I think 30 hours on this between three um, narrowband filters. Uh, so this is just a straight SHO processing of it. Um, I wanted to put it together quickly because I've been not doing anything astronomy related for months. And uh, so I definitely have some gradients I need to try and get out of it, but I wanted to see what it looked like. And I, I think it's a good start. Hopefully I'll get a better picture out of it when I take care of the backgrounds. But um, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> just one image. 
Uh, yeah, Brian, was that the, uh, I think it was like, I don't know, like three or four months ago, was that the one that you were like actually imaging during one of these imaging meetings? Was it, are you asking me? And that, oh, excuse me, not Brian. Yeah, I'm sorry, Brian. Uh, and, <laughs> and, oh, I'm sorry. You said Brian, I was just, okay, what was the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, what I was asking is, is that I think it was like three meetings ago or four meetings ago, uh, you were actually imaging this during the meeting? Is uh, that what this well, is? Well, I, I remember there was a meeting where David Keller was outside. Um, I don't remember if I, if I was imaging this during one of our meetings or not. Okay. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was Keller actually, Andy. Yeah, okay. One thing I think is pretty cool is like this is in Brian's mosaic, but th there's so much like um, difference in scale and the images we all take. It's easy to get lost. Like you can, I mean, you can zoom in and see all this stuff, you know, and then no matter how far you zoom out, you still have all kinds of stuff in the sky that he's showing in his mosaic. Um, it's pretty cool. So what, what were your equipment here? Uh, this is IC405 region, the uh, flaming star, I believe. Is what it's no, I mean, I'm sorry, you're imaging equipment when you do this. I'm sorry, I didn't understand one more time. Uh, the imaging equipment, what did you use? Oh, right. Okay. Um, this was with a Canon 200 millimeter uh, camera lens and on an ASI 1600 mono filter wheel. Um, I believe I was running this at about F. 3.3. I think I'm going to stop that down to four uh, going forward. Um, so yeah, it's a, it a simple camera lens, but it's a 200 millimeter, not 50. Okay, very good. Okay. And the mount was the mount was a Skywatcher EQ6R, which is the sister of sister mount that Brian was that Brian was using, the one he mentioned. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Chris, I can make some mosaic comments that are slightly different if you want. Go for it. All right, see if I can share it here. I hope you can. Chris, you might want to unmute everybody. I don't know if... Yeah, I'm trying to find where that is. It's like uh, I, I have an option here that says ask to unmute all, but other than that... Is that showing, Chris? I can't yeah, tell. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I do my mosaic slightly differently because uh, this is an 86 panel. Uh, and I wouldn't want to try to do that in Pixon and Sight with 86 panels. <clears throat> uh, so I did this in, in uh, uh, image composite editor for the Windows uh, program. Uh, I've talked about these before. I just want to say that, that I, I tried to do these things in Pixon and Sight and in, in APP, and it, they just can't seem to handle this that many. Uh, Different panels. So, and this one, this one's 33,000 by 14,000 pixels, <laughs> 45 degrees wow. sky. So, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty big. Um, I just collected all the mosaics I've done in a similar way. And that's just, that's really part of it. It's just, I added the, the uh, uh, oxygen sulfur onto it. So, that's just two panels. That's relatively small. And then this is another one, which is, I think, how many five panels of, of the region from, from the, uh, well, here's the eagle here and then the trippet and all that over here. And I've shown these before, but, and these are all done with camera lens and, and uh, my ATIC460EX. Again, put together with Pixon site for processing and then, then the, uh, the Microsoft ICE for, uh, putting things together and it does a nice job. Uh, and then there's my Orion I did now, what, a couple of years ago, I guess. Uh, and so it's similar to what, what Brian has, uh, but just hydrogen alpha, no color in that. So I'm, I'm now thinking about, you got me thinking about extending this uh, going beyond mm -hmm. to get more. That's an interesting, interesting notion to try to extend this. Uh, and this is the this is 56 panels of the moon put together. You can do that in the mosaic, and you get a lot of detail. You can zoom in a lot more on these things when you get when you make little things and put them all together. Uh, this is probably this was not picks in sight. This was with uh, uh, auto stacker and those things. 
for that. And then this is the Orion one I've showed before also. This is the, the hydrogen alpha and then put on top of that the radio, the radio signals from that region that Dan Reich uh, gave to me. So there's all kinds of things one can do with these mosaics. But I've, I've found personally that to do mosaics with a lot of different panels that fixed in sight, I wouldn't want to try to do it in fixed in sight unless they have something I don't know about. So it depends on kind of on the size of things that you want to work on. I think what you use. Anyway. Uh, 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 Steve? Yeah. So I'm looking at the uh, uh, radio. I mean, you showed us this, uh, the radio uh, uh, right. uh, part of the uh, image there uh, to us before. Um, right. Now, are these just arbitrary colors or are like the cooler colors like short wavelength and then going up? Yes. yes. Uh, Dan, Dan did this, this work with his students and uh, gave me the, the uh, image. And I just, I just um, put it on top of my image so we could see what, what things were producing hydrogen versus radio. Uh, uh, and, uh, it's, obvious, it's obvious where, where the radio is coming from, from the Barnard's loop and, and the other larger, brighter structures in, in Orion. Mm -hmm. And I, I asked him about, about getting radio for the, the big 86 one here the very first one I showed you, that one, but he doesn't have any radio data for that area. So I uh, couldn't, couldn't try the same thing there. But this one, you know, you can, you can really zoom in pretty far on these things and see all the, all the usual structures in the Northern sky from, from Cygnus to Cassiopeia. So uh, that's one of the nice things about mosaics is you can zoom in on them and see interesting things that you don't necessarily see if you just take a, a, a complete wide field of that area. So that's one of the reasons I like doing mosaics as you can zoom in. Anyway. Yeah, the, the resolution is conserved, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so there, this is about 120 hours of data here, uh, 86 panels, and, and plus another 120 hours of processing probably. <laughs> but yeah, okay, that's all I've got. Okay, anybody else? I mean, I got a little bit, but I know anybody else wants to go first. I have a few, if uh, it won't take long. Okay, go for it. Uh, share screen. All right, uh, you see my screen? Yes. There is. Okay, so uh, if it's showing the right thing, this is the other direction. This is only about half a degree across, so... Um, yeah, I guess this is January 21st, so after the last meeting. Uh, we had uh, some nice weather. I just pulled my old C8 out uh, with my ASI 1600 and just did some very small projects. So these are all uh, maybe 30, 40 minutes of data. I just started going through some asterisms. Uh, this one's in Orion, actually. It might be in one of those mosaics if we zoomed in far enough, but it's called the 37 cluster. If you could see it, it's one of these things that's actually not too hard to see what they're talking about. Um, and then the ET cluster, I think that's in Cassiopeia or that area. Uh, you can see the two eyes and then the ET body kind of going to the left, I guess, if I'm seeing it the way most people see it. Mm -hmm. But these are fun to do. They're quick and easy to process. Uh, and then I started playing with... Uh, uh, affinity photo because they have stacking built into it. So I just wanted some new data. So I did just a real quick night. I grabbed some HA and uh, RGB for a uh, familiar area of the horse head here over two nights. And uh, the main thing about this is I did the entire thing in affinity. So I stacked it and combined the filters and did all the stretching and star minimization. All that was done in affinity. So I thought that was kind of neat that you could do it all with, I guess it's still a $25 program. I thought that was pretty amazing. And then another night when the moon, I guess, was a problem, I just shot the kind of core area of the Rosette Nebula in HA and stacked all that in Affinity also. So I, I, I'm not going to replace Pix Insight. I just think it's rather fascinating. All this cool software we're getting. Uh, it's just fun to play with the new stuff in Nina, uh, Shark Cap. The beta has some sequencer built into it. I think I'm going to play with this weekend. 
um, it's just fun to play with all the software. So uh, that's all I had. Uh, there we go. I think I gave it back. Yeah, you did. Uh, let me see. I'll go ahead and share a screen. Let's see. Hold on. You can do it. Can everybody see that? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, this is just going back to emphasize what I was talking about earlier. Uh, so, this actually is my first, I guess, snapshot of uh, M42, the Orion Nebula, which was in uh, Brian's uh, picture. Uh, maybe if you zoom out as far as Brian's pictures, uh, uh, his picture goes, uh, it would look a little bit more appeasing. But basically what this is, is uh, you see how the stars are all like all flared? Well, this was uh, back when I was starting to think like, well, maybe I do want to do imaging because, uh, you know, I started out as a, uh, as a visual guy and I found a, uh, a camera that had been talked about in some of the uh, amateur astronomy books uh, called uh, the Nikon 995. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows what that is, you're probably laughing your butt off right now. Uh, but, but basically, uh, they had uh, uh, made an adapter where you can take the Nikon 995 and hold it to the eyepiece. Most people who they get, well, when they get into your imaging, uh, you know, through, through a telescope at least, uh, they probably grab their smartphone or whatever camera that they own and just hold it up to the eyepiece and see if they can ca capture a picture of uh, what the telescope is uh, aimed at. So um, I had read that Nikon 995 uh, was able to do something like this without uh, investing in a, a DSLR or a CCD camera. And uh, there was a, uh, a website, I don't know if it's still around, I think it's called Scopetronics or maybe that was the brand of the adapter or scope stuff, something like that. And uh, yeah, so they made an adapter and I was able to put this on my eyepiece and this is what you got. So, but uh, uh, like I was talking about earlier, uh, moving on from that, just having a camera, I'm looking through the uh, telescope. This is about 30 second exposure. That's all that uh, camera was able to go up to. But what was interesting about the 995, may not be a DSLR, but uh, what was odd is that um, I don't know where the threshold was, but beyond a certain threshold of uh, long exposures that you would do with this camera, it actually would do an automatic back uh, uh, dark frame subtraction from it. So that was different. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so there you go, afocal. And then and I got it, uh, my first DSLR, which is a 350D, um, I improved upon it. And this was with uh, a, uh, a telescope I don't, I don't have anymore. This was with what was termed as a, a Schmidt Newtonian. And it sounds just like uh, if you're familiar with that uh, telescope technology, it's just what it sounds like. It was a Schmidt corrector plate put in front of a, uh, of a uh, Newtonian reflector. And uh, the biggest advantage of that is that it did subdue a little bit of the column that's inherent in Newtonian uh, designs. And uh, um, if you don't like diffraction spikes, well, since there's a corrector plate in front, there's no spider vein, you don't get the diffraction spikes. So you know, no idea what these are right here, but that one looks like maybe a satellite or a, a jet that moves through this one. And But this was with a, a DSLR, and this was also a 30 second uh, image. So uh, anyway, uh, this one was probably back in early 2008 and uh, it just spiraled out of control as far as spending money on imaging. <laughs> this was probably, uh, I believe it was the same year and uh, got that. And then I hadn't looked at M42 in years, perhaps like more than a decade. And uh, so this is uh, when I posted yesterday, I was able to or not yesterday, excuse me, last week. And so I was able to take it to quite a bit the next level. And uh, this is a HDR image, of course, uh, if you uh, didn't hear the details of this at the beginning of uh, the meeting. Um, this was uh, a hydrogen alpha image with, taken with an ASI 183 mono camera. And uh, then I uh, updated the uh, DSLR I had all the way up to a 600D, which is uh, called the Rebel T3i. 
Um, I had that modified where I had the uh, infrared uh, uh, filter removed from the sensor and then put on a more gentle, per se, uh, filter on the front of it where it would filter out some of the uh, infrared, but it would allow through the hydrogen alpha that we've been talking about this whole time, which uh, hydrogen alpha, um, I keep getting this wrong. I don't know if it's like a dyslexic memory for me, but I think it's 656 nanometers is the wavelength for uh, hydrogen alpha, or it's 565. But, but anyway, it's a sort of on the long uh, wavelength side. So it makes sense that it would show up as red in this picture or uh, go back uh, to the uh, uh, other image I had here. Uh, that's hydrogen alpha that you see in here, even though this camera wasn't modified. Um, that's what gives the red uh, uh, colors in most of the images that you're going to see. Hydrogen alpha, um, uh, if you have a narrow band filter, you can take uh, images of hydrogen alpha, although it's going to be black and white because it's a single wavelength, but it's in the red section of the spectrum. And then um, uh, going along these lines as far as uh, evolving through things, uh, so this one was with a 30-second uh, exposure from a DSLR, one of the first images I took back in 2008. This one right here, this is a flame nebula, I did the same thing. Here we go, there's a nice blue star. That's the uh, infamous al almond tag that can really wreak havoc on your uh, horse head nebulae uh, uh, pictures that you may uh, you know, be trying to uh, uh, image. and. Uh, so again, this was a 350D, so it still had uh, an infrared uh, uh, um, filter on it made by the manufacturer, but uh, you don't get any of the red here. You can just barely see it starting to show up right here. Uh, the actual horse head is probably like right off, right here off to the edge. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, that was the scene. This is also a single 30 uh, second image. Then finally, I got my Ape Hotel scope and so using the T3i that was modified, um, I got this. So, uh, big improvement. Uh, well, for one, the uh, uh, field of view is uh, uh, bigger. And this is with, uh, um, see it up here, I was able to push it all the way out to 130 seconds. I was going to stop at two minutes, but I thought I could push a little bit further. This was taken on the outskirts of Apex. So, I got a good look of the uh, Horse head here, got the flame here, and then we got uh, that, that structure right there, the reflection there, anyway, probably has a name. I don't know what it is. And again, you have Bright Allen Tack right here, which is one of the stars of uh, Ryan's Belt. So there's that. And then what I did is um, um, I went in and uh, took an image, or went into this area and uh, imaged it with uh, uh, in the hydrogen alpha wavelength and in the same. Uh, uh, vein of uh, how I uh, uh, imaged the uh, Orion Nebula here, applied it to this guy right here. Okay, and this was uh, with a uh, yeah, camera lens that was stopped down to f4. That's why you get these diffraction spikes. So you have the individual blades of the aperture opening uh, starting to close in, and you get these diffraction spikes. Well basically get them all the time with uh, camera lenses. So you can see it pretty well here. And let's see, somewhere in here is my other one. Let's see, is it this one? No. Uh, not that one, not that one, not that one. Let's see, let me see if I can find it. For the, yeah, let's see. yeah, there it is. And so I did the same thing using uh, um, ASI 183, where I went back to uh, this image, color image I took in 2012 with a uh, DSLR. And in the same respect, I took this right here with a uh, CCD camera that was only 2.8 megapixels. But I did the same process with the newest camera I have, the ASI 183, and did hydrogen alpha, and it came out so much better. So, uh, yeah, so that's all I have. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can do something else here. Uh, so I was talking to Michael Fulbright earlier. And uh, let's see. Wait, oops. Let me stop my share here. Uh, I was talking to Michael Fulbright earlier. And uh, one of the things uh, I want to try to do, because as we uh, approach uh, 
spring season, we start to look away from the uh, arms of the Milky Way where we find all these nebulae uh, in these pictures we've been showing. And uh, I want to get to uh, smaller objects, uh, mostly galaxies, right? And uh, planetary nebulae, which tend to be pretty small uh, compared to these absolutely ginormous uh, nebulae pictures that you've been seeing. So uh, let's see. Okay, so I started my video. Uh, so over here, these are my feet or my legs right here. You can probably see my uh, uh, Mars globe right there um, in the back, <laughs> sitting on the floor. But uh, here's what I wanted to show you guys. I'll hold it up to the camera. The laptop's on the floor. But uh, here's this guy. Okay, so this is an ASI uh, 294. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so this is an ASI 294. And then over here, connected to the same apparatus here, this is uh, 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 the ASI uh, 174 that I use for my uh, guide cam. And what we have here is something I got a very long time ago. Uh, it's called an on-axis guider. So off-axis guider usually you just has a camera that goes into the light path of uh, the imager, but it just goes off to the side so you can find a guide star. Okay, so not back, uh, we're talking about auto guiding here. An off-axis guider will go and look for a star in here and start guiding on that, uh, on that star uh, simultaneously as your imaging camera is taking a, uh, a picture. Now, in a, uh, in a uh, configuration like that, uh, what you would have, you wouldn't have this like right angle kind of uh, thing that you're seeing here. Your imager would be back here It'll be straight long tube, and then up here would be your uh, off-axis guider. Okay, in this case, the on-axis guider it's switched. Okay, and the way it works is you can picture this as sort of a as a uh, a star diagonal for your uh, telescope, where you would probably put an eyepiece up here to look through your eye, uh, into your telescope. If you were doing things visually. Okay, so what's in here? is there is a uh, there is a mirror and just like a diagonal uh, photons come in here and get reflected up here and they hit the imaging sensor of my imaging camera right here but the mirror that's in here it's what's termed as a beam splitter mirror or a cold mirror uh, what it uh, what the imager uh, actually imaging camera here is seeing it's seeing the whole spectrum all the way up to uh, until you get to around the uh, longer wavelengths of infrared. And the mirror actually passes through those wavelengths through here, and it comes out to your, uh, to the auto guiding uh, camera that I have back here. So this imager, my imaging camera sees everything except for infrared. Infrared goes completely through that uh, mirror that's on inside here. And uh, the stars that, uh, uh, all stars emit uh, infrared light, uh, the, image, uh, the guiding camera can see those stars in infrared, okay? Uh, the only downside to this, uh, 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 or at least uh, in my experience, because I haven't used it very much, uh, is that uh, because the mirror is tilted, one side is going to be sharper uh, than the other as far as your field of view, and that's called astigmatism, where you can't really see uh, a perfectly, uh, I guess, confocal image going into the imager. So the uh, stars are a little flared on one side, okay? So it has, uh, they're, they're astigmatic per se. So they're not exactly super perfect uh, uh, round stars that you're going to see. And, uh, but the biggest advantage of that is that if you were to use an off-axis guider, if we pretend this imager is the off-axis guider, it has to go around and hunt for a star. Whereas uh, with an on-axis guider, the guider right here can see absolutely everything that the imager is seeing or that the imaging uh, camera is seeing. So that's the biggest advantage of this. And uh, uh, basically, I just wanted it all in one unit. And because uh, galaxy season is coming up or where we're looking at really tiny objects in the night sky, uh, what is it? The only telescope that I would like to use this for, with is the SCT. Well, the only SCT I have is a C11, which is a Hulk compared to uh, 
most of the other uh, um, telescopes that you would use. And uh, so I slip this guy into the C11 and hopefully uh, what will happen is that we'll be guiding at the same focal length as the imager, the guide camera and the imager on uh, imaging camera will be guiding at the same focal length. So, uh, so that's what this is. And I've only used this like, I think only twice and it works as advertised. So, but I haven't really put it through its paces as far as actually using it uh, to take some serious images. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna we'll try it on my, uh, my refractor first uh, uh, this weekend if uh, it's not too soggy wet outside. But anyway, okay, so that's all I have. Anyway. Uh, yeah, to see my uh, Imperial Starfire back there. <laughs> so, let's see. Oops. Well, I'm trying to unshare. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, I guess that's everything. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or uh, anything, uh, other things we want to bring up before we conclude? No, I don't see anything here uh, other than Steve Goodman. He congratulates you, Brian. Thank you for such a nice presentation. Thank you guys for letting me. And we look forward to, I guess, next year uh, where we all have uh, a supercomputer showing us a bigger one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, I guess meeting adjourned, and we'll see you back here next month uh, in March uh, where, uh, darn it. Uh, <laughs> Full price. What's the guy's name for Mina? Yeah, it'll be Dale Gint. Oh, Dale. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mina. And uh, yeah, so I hope everyone can turn out and impress them with all the interesting people. Okay. Well, I guess we'll see you uh, next month. Uh, Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Later.